It's dawn, in the heart of the most powerful nation on earth. In a Washington coffee shop, one of the world's most respected journalists is already at her usual corner table, armed with a black coffee, the Washington Post and the New York Times. Today's feature article is about American soldiers killed in Iraq. Then it's off to her desk at the White House, which is a short stroll away. Great to see my Right, great to see you. So how many times have you, do you reckon you brought down here into the White House? I heard it 50 million times. <laughs> I don't know. Ever since January 1961. 1961. That's how long I've been. Helen Thomas has reported on every president since John F. Kennedy. Over that time, almost five decades, she's come to be known as the First Lady of the Press. She currently writes a syndicated column for the Hearst newspapers. We lost our, our honor, our integrity throughout the world. Once inside the press room, Helen hits the phones, exchanging gossip, sniffing out fresh angles on the day's stories. What is defeat and what is winning? She's known for her strong opinions and fearless questioning of people in power. Go into the briefing now. Everybody will just repeat what, what the administration wants you to say. Because there's very little challenge. And even if there is, they back off. They give you the robotic answers. Seats in the briefing room are highly sought after. At the top of the pecking order are those in the front row. You get asked very often to, uh, to ask a question these days. Yes, at briefings I can. Oh, I'm not uh, that lucky on uh, news conferences. Good afternoon. Uh, Congress is starting this week uh, another discussion, a series of hearings looking at the FISA reforms that we passed early in August. That's the FISA, uh, Dana Perino, the White House spokesperson, is new to this job. Today's hot topic is the President's push to extend a controversial security law, known as FISA. Helen regards it as an attack on civil liberties. And we are seeking to make those reforms permanent. Are you saying the President's going to uh, veto any, any change in the FISA law, eavesdropping on all Americans? That's kind of a loaded question. Um, we have taken great pains to make sure that we can protect the country while also preserving our civil liberties. I'm happy with being eavesdropped on their, their telephone calls and so forth. Um, that's a, a, a gross, that's a gross uh, uh, mischaracterization of what the good folks at the National Security Agency do to protect this country, which is to focus on the threats at hand. So you can call yeah, it the security, yeah. but you're also taking away our liberties. Our, our liberties are intact. By the time the briefing breaks up, Nothing more has been revealed about the administration's planned security laws. I wish that every press secretary would understand we pay them. People can handle the truth, but what they can't handle is lies, one lie after another. Each afternoon, Helen makes her way to the Hearst offices. Can that lock you? Make sure you use a name. Let's see, W E L. Computer problems notwithstanding, it's here that she writes her weekly opinion column. Her fame is such that she's also in demand for speaking appearances and talk shows, like this one on the political cable channel C SPAN. Now, now I write a column. And the editor looked at it, and he said, oh, I really was writing wire copy. Where's the edge? The what? 
your opinion. My what? So now I wake up in the morning and I say, who do I hate today? And that's how you, and that's how you write a column. What keeps you going? Outrage. That's my adrenaline. Outrage. Anger at injustice. To not be able to look them in the eye and say we're doing the right thing, and we are doing the right thing. A democracy in Iraq is going But to taking on the powerful can also land a journalist in trouble. She's been quoted describing George W. Bush as the worst president in history. So the press secretary called me, did you say that? And I said, I cannot tell a lie. I lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. I went to and I've been in the doghouse ever since. Do you regret saying it, or regret it being reported, looking back on it now? Well, I, I didn't expect to be reported on it. No. I, uh, I regretted immediately after, because I thought maybe I had prejudged, but I don't regret it now. <laughs> Time has, has vindicated my view in my own point of view. <laughs> We're talking about an icon here. Chuck Lewis is Helen's bureau chief at Hearst Newspapers. He stood by her in the face of orchestrated campaigns to shut down Helen's questioning of the administration. She alone asked the tough questions leading up to the uh, invasion of Iraq. I can't hear Ricky at all now. I know White House correspondents over there who were afraid for their own professional career to ask tough questions because they knew that they were on TV. The press conference is the only forum, the only institution we have where a person can be questioned on a regular basis and held accountable. But Helen's tough questioning over the Iraq war came at a cost. The veteran correspondent was ignored at Bush's press conferences for three years until this one in March last year. Uh, Helen. You're going to be sorry. <laughs> Your decision to invade Iraq has caused the deaths of thousands of Americans and Iraqis. You, every reason given, publicly at least, has turned out not to be true. My question is, why did you really want to go to war? Yeah, I, I think your premise, and I'll do respect to your question and to you as a, a lifelong journalist, is that, you know, I didn't want war. To assume I wanted war is just uh, is just flat wrong, Helen, in all due respect. No, no, hold on for a second, please. No, excuse me, excuse me. No president wants war. I think after 9-11, reporters again went into kind of a, a syndrome of torpor, um, a coma, really, where they uh, were afraid to ask challenging questions, afraid to be called unpatriotic and un-American because uh, uh, the country was in such crisis after this first major attack on our own soil. But I think, and, and therefore, I think the reporters let the, let the country down. Good morning. While I'm in Washington, President Bush holds another of his rare press conferences with journalists. This time, Helen is not called on for a question. I'm watching you on the, uh, on the television at the uh, President's um, press conference. You were in the front row, as usual, but you didn't get asked. I saw you put your hand up. <laughs> he just ignored you and moved on to everybody else in the front row. He What's hurt going my on? feelings. He really hurt me. Cut me to the quick. <laughs> Does he do that all the time? He's called on me on the rarest of occasions. Other reporters have said that you've, you're the only one who's really outspoken in the White House, the only reporter who is really outspoken consistently. What do you make of that? That I'm, I am? Yes. I believe in being consistent. <laughs> I'm not going to change character because I've called names or anything. That would be ridiculous. If I wanted to suck up and be, belong to the club, I would have done that a long time ago. Even, the, even when the president gives you a look like he did earlier today? Who cares? I gave him a look. He doesn't intimidate you? <laughs> no, he didn't. I felt sorry for him. I thought, if you're afraid of any question, when you get to be president of the United States, you really should be able to answer anything. 
You can say no comment, there isn't anything wrong with that, but, but to be afraid? No, that's it. Helen talks about presidents with a rare authority. She's been face to face with nine of them. Travelling the globe in their entourage. Observing their successes and failures. I thought that John F. Kennedy was the most inspired. I think he understood the power of the presidency to do good. And I think that he uplifted us all because he had great ideas. Lyndon B. Johnson, I think he, he made the greatest contribution to our country in the last half of the 20th century, the last 50 years, on the domestic side. But of course, uh, he was, the buzzsaw was Vietnam. Then on to Richard Nixon. Nixon was tremendously brilliant in politics, but he, he didn't really relate. He could speak to crowds of thousands, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, he, had, he was very shy, very reserved, and so forth. And he always took the wrong road. Jimmy Carter, I think that he did a great thing by putting human, human rights at the centerpiece of our, our foreign policy. Reagan, there was a Reagan revolution. He did turn the country to the right. Uh, it was a question of social Darwinism. If you can't make it, tough. Survival of the fittest. Clinton, I think he came in with, as all presidents do, very well meant, very well intentioned, but he sure missed the boat. He didn't even understand you have to know your enemy. And from the second he stepped into the White House, he was always being investigated. After him, George Bush, Jr. Black and white, dead or alive, with us or against us, the most simplistic philosophy. And in my opinion, he wanted to go to war from the moment he came into office. He said, in fact, that he wanted to be a war president. And he once told his biographer that only war presidents are remembered in history. This fundraiser is to give single parents, men or women, an opportunity to be able to go to school when they may not have had that opportunity before. Helen Thomas still maintains a heavy schedule. This week alone, she has engagements in Michigan, Florida, and this fundraiser in Virginia. Not a bit. How are you? How are you? I'm glad to see you again. This event has drawn together the well-heeled ladies who lunch from all over this part of Republican-leaning Virginia. What you first learn when you're covering for a wire service, mm -hmm. you check out all the facts. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. Check it out. <laughs> I am so delighted to have Helen Thomas here today as our honored guest. The audience may be Bush supporters, but as usual, Helen Thomas is speaking her mind. It's sheer madness to continue this war without end. We've lost our honor in the world. We are ident identified with torture of prisoners, shackling of detainees. We never charged... Not everyone appreciates the lecture. We did not call them terrorists. But eventually Helen gives them what they came for, her unique tales from life inside the White House. No president has ever liked the press, dating back to George Washington. I wasn't covering him, but... Uh, <laughs> president Ford likened my questions to acupuncture. <laughs> he said that if God had created the world in six days, on the seventh day he could not have rested. He would have had to explain it to Helen Thomas. <laughs> When President Reagan was told that the Sandinistas, the Marxist communists, had fired on a press helicopter at the Honduran border, Reagan said, there's some good in everyone. <laughs> and when President Clinton was asked by a friend, why the press always went along in the motorcade when he went jogging, he laughed and said, they just want to see if I drop dead. That's true. <laughs> we were on what we call the body watch. <laughs> 
Lincoln said, let the people know the facts, the country will be safe. I believe that. So ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for all of us. Let's give peace a chance and let it begin with us. Thank you. And I love seeing her sit in that front row and just give everybody the devil, you know? I love her strength. She is what many of us should aspire to be. Alright, are we ready? One, two, I thought Helen was absolutely magnificent. I think she speaks for all of us. I, I really think that she speaks more for us than any president has spoken back at us. Miles and miles to go before we swing it. Back at the White House, and another deadline looms. Helen's workload may have lightened a little as she approaches 90, but she's not planning to stop any time soon. I'm in touch with uh, the up-and-coming journalists, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, there's... I don't see a Helen Thomas necessarily among them. Uh, Helen, in, some, in many ways, I think, is a unique person and an institution that will never be duplicated. I'm running on empty too, but I do think that uh, it isn't that I think that I have uh, some special cause and, and different from anyone else, but I do think that I'm such a good irritant to them that <laughs> I should be around. They should know that somebody's saying no. Mm -hmm. 